Welcome to CP Time, the only show that's for the culture. Today, we're discussing the history of African Americans on screen. It's how the world sees us and how we're forced to see ourselves not being in decision-making positions at the studio level, but that's not the point. Whether it's cleaning up for white people or driving a car for an old white lady or driving a car for a crazy white man, black <laughs> actors have done it all. When we see a black character on screen, we're filled with pride. We're filled with hope for the promise of a new day. We also wonder, how long till they kill this nigga? Because every black actor at some point in his career gets killed. We have the on-screen survival rate of ribs at a barbecue. You'd think they'd at least let Denzel live, but no. He dies all the time, constantly. My personal favorite Denzel death is in the movie Fallen, where Denzel dies alone in the forest, like a bitch. Why was he even in the woods in the first place? I knew he was gonna die once I saw too many trees. Ain't nothing in the forest for black people. But the history of black actors dying on screen is full of remarkable achievements. For example, did you know the quickest black death on camera was Omar Epps in Scream 2? The only black man to die before the title sequence. The movie hadn't even started yet, and the producers decided it was a little too dark in here. Jada Pinkett, get your ass out of there, too. One way or another, all black actors succumb to the scriptwriter's ink, except for one. LL Cool J. Movie after movie, LL Cool J hung on to the end credits. Caught up, lived. Charlie's Angels survived. Toys, I didn't see that one, but I heard he made it through. In fact, LL was supposed to get eaten in Deep Blue Sea, but out of respect for the streak, the shark ain't Samuel L. Jackson. Game recognized game, because life loves Cool James. Now, some scholars would argue that Mr. Cool J died in Rollerball, but the truth is, he fell, and his body was never recovered nor seen on screen, leaving the death open-ended with room for a potential sequel or TV spinoff. So the CP Time Recognition Award goes to no one other than LL Cool J. LL, you've shown young black actors that it is possible not to get shot in the face or eaten or dismembered in every damn movie. Now, unfortunately, LL Cool J couldn't be here tonight because he didn't know he was getting this award. He never heard of this show, and uh, also nobody would give up his email address. I guessed Uncle L at NCIS.com, but it bounced back. The man's a recluse. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. This has been CP Time, and remember, we are for the culture. See you soon. Ah, welcome to CP Time, the only show that's for the culture. Today, we look back at legendary black politicians. John Lewis, Shirley Chisholm, Barack Obama, just a few of the icons we won't be talking about today. Instead, we look to those whose achievements are a little less appreciated by history. Let's start with 2012 Republican presidential candidate Herman Cain. <laughs> Herman Cain was a businessman with a colorful personality and zero knowledge of world affairs. When they ask me who's the president of you, Becky, 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 Stan, Stan, I'm gonna say, you know, I don't know. Do you know? Man trying to get elected by speaking gibberish. Herman Cain was ahead of his time. In fact, if not for Herman Cain, Black men wouldn't be able to get on TV today wearing a cowboy hat while talking out the side of their face. It is pitchfork and torches time in America. Now let's turn our attention to Congressman Robert Smalls, a Civil War hero who escaped slavery by stealing a Confederate ship. Some say that qualified him as being off the chain. <laughs> Moving on. Let's turn our attention to Alan Keyes, another Republican and legendary politician. Keyes ran for national office in 1988, 92, 96, 2000, 2004, and 2008. All he do is lose, like a bitch. 
The brother had determination. Hell, I'd be embarrassed if I lost six national elections. Hell, I'm embarrassed just walking through Joanne Fabrics. I go at night. I make my own nightgowns. Thank you very much. And finally, no discussion on black politicians would be complete without Marion Barry. Barry was elected mayor of Washington, D.C. in 1979. Was he a good mayor? Was he a bad mayor? Nobody will ever truly know. All we do remember is that the man smoked the crack. That's right. In 1990, Mayor Barry was arrested in a sting operation and caught on video smoking crack cocaine. He said he'd get drugs off the street. Word is born. It's our own damn fault for not asking him how. The city forgave him, and in 1994, he was re-elected with approval ratings as high as he was. The country was shocked, especially Alan Keyes. He was all angry. He was like, what the f do I have to do to get elected? He's smoking crack over there. Barry went on to have other scandals. But if voters don't have a problem with you smoking crack, you basically have full immunity. That's why when I started this job, I showed up two weeks late. Gotta set that bar low. Now, nobody cares that I walk around the office in a nightgown. They admire the handiwork. I'm Roy Wood Jr. And this has been CP Time. And remember, we're for the culture. Check out my Etsy page and purchase your very own custom silver rights nightgowns. <laughs> Oh, welcome to CP Time, the only show that's for the culture. Now, normally, when you think about African-American innovation, you think about the peanut or booty twerking. <laughs> but today, we're discussing the history of African-American innovators forgotten by time, because black innovators have been contributing to America's economy from the beginning. And no, I'm not just talking about slavery, but let's talk about slavery. <laughs> Jack Daniels whiskey. For example, now, you might think this fine Tennessee hooch was invented by some goofy-ass white dude, and to be fair, Jack Daniels does sound like the name of a dude that fights raccoons. <laughs> but did you know it was a slave who taught Jack how to make whiskey? That's right. Whiskey in the 1850s was taught to Jack Daniels by a former slave. His name was Nearest Green. The whiskey ended up being named after Jack Daniel even though Nearest Green wanted to call it, hey, man, drink this shit to get your mind off of slavery. <laughs> After the Civil War, Nearest Green became America's first black master distiller. So let's honor Mr. Green and the fruits of his labor with a toast. Ugh. Damn, Nearest. You got to make it burn. Wasn't your life hard enough? <clears throat> Now, on to the story of Jerry Lawson, a self-taught engineer who invented the video game cartridge. Before Jerry Lawson, the only video game you could play was Pong. Look at this boring-ass video game. Action-packed. Jerry Lawson, with his invention, gave black people an escape from racism, much in the same way Nearest Green did with his Jack Daniels. So, Let's toast to Nearest Green. <laughs> oh, burnt like a bitch. <clears throat> Finally, our last black innovator, Lonnie Johnson, an aerospace engineer who in 1982 invented the Super Soaker, an invention that brought joy to both children and wet T-shirt contest audiences alike. Anyway. The only reason I wanted to mention Lonnie is so that I could honor Nearest Green in the most efficient way possible. High-pressure alcohol dispenser. That's right. Oh, Lordy, Lordy, right there. Yes, Lord. Woo! Lordy, Lordy. <clears throat> so there you have it. To black innovators, we say thank you. Now, somebody bring me a soda, because I got to get something to chase this with. Oh, no. Ah, welcome to CP Time, the only show that's for the culture. As we end Black History Month, we look back on the accomplishments of black women. 
And joining me for this episode is Dulce Sloan. Thank you, Roy. But I've been here for every episode. Oh, I think you must be mistaken. CP Time is a solo show. No, 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 no. Check the tape. I was there when you talked about actors and black politicians, and I was right in front of you during the last one. Hmm. I apologize, ma. Peripherals are not what they used to be. Don't blame the cataracts, Roy. You forgot. Like a bitch. <laughs> but it's okay. Black women have been overlooked in American history, but we've still accomplished great things. Like Madam C.J. Walker, America's first black woman to be a self-made millionaire. No, no, no. no. I, I do believe that's Aretha Franklin, Dulce. <laughs> Just because Aretha's been in a fur since 1973 doesn't mean she was the first millionaire. Madam C.J. Walker earned her millions in the early 1900s. That's old money. And she did it with hair care products, hair grower, scalp ointment, and, of course, she revolutionized the hot comb. Ah, the smell of hot grease and laid edges on a Saturday morning. You know, I have her to thank for all these scars on my ears. <laughs> uh, there's also Marie Van Britten Brown, an innovator who, in 1966, during the heart of the Civil Rights Movement, invented the home security system. Before her, when someone broke in, people just yelled, Hey, man, don't take my shit! But while her invention might have dramatically decreased theft, it didn't stop ADT from stealing the idea from her. We also can't forget Mae Carol Jemison, the first black woman to travel in space. You know what I've always said, Dulce, is that more black people should go to space. Not even for science, just for safety. There's no police up there. Ooh, facts, facts. And I just want to thank you for bringing these wonderful pieces to the show. We often forget what black women did in American history. History? <laughs> We're forgetting black women now. Quick. Tell me, who founded the Black Lives Matter movement? Well, that's very easy. Everyone knows that's D-Ray, the man in the blue vest. D-Ray? No, no. Mm -hmm. The original founders were Elisa Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi. Mm -hmm. Were they ever wearing a blue vest? No. OK, well, how was I supposed to know? Sound like a fashion problem. Well, oh, there's only 30 minutes left here in Black History Month. And who knows? Maybe next year there won't be a need for this program, because we would have reached the mountaintop. <laughs> that is funny every year. <gasps> I'm Roy Wood Jr. And I'm Dulce Slow. And this has been CP Time. And remember, we're, we're for, for the, the culture. culture. You don't get to say like a bitch. That's my phrase. I mean, this listen. is my show. <laughs>
It would be like me eating lunch at a Ross dress for less, which I do. <laughs> the third great civil rights law was the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which let the federal government intervene in states that suppressed the black vote. It was a landmark piece of legislation. Oh, it was until 2013 when the Supreme Court knocked down a huge chunk of it. They said it worked so well, we didn't need it anymore. The Supreme Court did the same thing that I did with my diabetes pills. They started working, so I stopped taking them. You keep taking something and it's working, hell, yeah, it's the best decision I ever made. Cause I got to have it. I got to have it, baby. Mm-hmm. That's all right, bro. <clears throat> and I'm back. So that's the story of the Fair Housing Act, the Civil Rights Act, and the Voting Rights Act, which together are like a Lord of the Rings trilogy for black people. Except for our golem, it's Jeff Sessions. <laughs> well, this has been CP Time, and I'm Roy Wood Jr. And as always, remember, we're for the culture. You wanna see my Ben Carson impersonation? <laughs> Welcome to CP Time, the only show that's for the culture. Now, it's no secret that black folks love us a good conspiracy theory. Like how rapper B.O.B. thinks the world is flat. Or most deaf doesn't think Osama bin Laden did 9-11. Or how I believe that Khloe Kardashian is O.J. Simpson's secret daughter. <laughs> oh, that O.J. always leaving DNA everywhere. No wonder they call him the juice. But the conspiracy theories that unite all black people are about the government. Uncle Sam gets more blame than alcohol after a pregnancy test. Like the conspiracy theory that the government created AIDS, which I personally don't believe. We all know that the only man-made disease is kidney stones. Somebody's sneaking them stones up there. Think about it. Then, of course, there's black folks' suspicion that during Hurricane Katrina, the government blew up the levees on purpose to flood out poor black neighborhoods and spare the white ones. That's right, the government even turned water against us. I'd expect that from racist ass lava, but not you, water. That's why I only shower now with lime Gatorade. Who can you trust? Now, I know you white people out there, y'all laughing, y'all think black people is crazy and gullible. I can hear you chuckling. <laughs> But this is serious. When you realize how many conspiracy theories against us turn out to be true, like how black people with syphilis thought they were being treated, but were actually part of a government experiment. That's right. The government did medical experiments on black people, and we didn't even get any superpowers. <laughs> if I'm gonna have syphilis, I should also get to be the, the She-Hulk or syphilis man or one of the new members of the Avengers. Fair is fair. And what about during the 1960s when we all said they were trying to sabotage Martin Luther King? And then in the 1990s, we found out that they were trying to sabotage Martin Luther King. They wiretapped him and released salacious transcripts of his most intimate moments of fornication with random women. I refused to read a single word of that slander. I did listen to that audio book, though. <laughs> Freaky beaky. So the next time you're fixing to laugh at a black person's conspiracy theory, just remember, we're batting about 250 on these. Which brings me to the biggest conspiracy theory of them all. That Popeye's chicken is a front for the CIA. A 10-piece and sides for $20. Those are crack prices. But thankfully, I've been able to resist this product for years because I know better than to ever give in to... Oh, my God. Oh, my, oh my God, they got biscuits, too. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. I'm Roy Wood Jr., and this has been CP Time. And remember...
Welcome to CP Time, the only show that's for the culture. Today is the 50-year anniversary of track stars John Carlos and Tommy Smith's historic protest for equal rights at the 1968 Olympics. Not only did they take a brave stand, they made it stylish for black people to wear gloves. <laughs> Shaft fought crime in gloves. Michael Jackson danced in gloves. It was a trend that lasted all the way to 1995 when O.J. Simpson single-handedly killed him. Allegedly. Fact is, black athletes have often been our most prominent protesters because they've had such a big audience. Since sports is the only time a bunch of white folks stare at black people without the cops getting called. <laughs> One of the first recorded black athlete protests was back in the early 1900s by boxer Jack Johnson, who boldly opposed racism by punching white men in the face and then dating white women. A trailblazer indeed. But sadly, many black athlete protesters don't get the recognition they deserve. For example, we may remember Carlos and Smith, but at the very next Summer Olympics, track star Wayne Collette protested for civil rights by having a casual conversation during the national anthem. The girls too that, chatting like they were in line at 7-Eleven. What are you in line for? Justice! Oh, that's cool. I was just getting some Reese's Pieces. <laughs> and we all know about LeBron James fighting for Black Lives Matter, but not many people know that in 2016, the entire WNBA Indiana Fever team took a knee before a playoff game to protest police brutality. The Fever lost that game, and I lost $400 betting on them. <laughs> I know what I owe you, Ricky. Stop getting my kids involved in this. You get your money. And we all hear about Colin Kaepernick and his protests, but not everyone remembers NBA player Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, who refused to stand during the anthem to protest American injustice against Muslims. Rauf's courage opened the door for people like Kaepernick to not only kneel, but to do it even blacker while sporting an afro and cornrows, which, according to scientists, are two of the blackest hairstyles on Earth. Only the Jerry Curl reigns supreme. <laughs> Sadly, black athletes usually pay a price for their political protests. Wayne Collette was suspended for the rest of the Olympic Games. Mahmoud Abdul Rauf was suspended by the NBA. And Colin Kaepernick lost his job and was blackballed by the NFL. Even worse for Colin, he was punished by Nike with a big ass endorsement deal. And you might not think getting millions of dollars is a punishment. It isn't. Until you start having aunts and uncles coming out of the woodwork asking you for money. <laughs> One time I found a $50 bill on the street. By the end of the day, I had six new aunts. The whole thing cost me $200. <laughs> you can't even divide that by six. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'm Roy Wood Jr. And this has been CP Time. And remember, we're for the culture. Hey, Colin, it's your Uncle Roy. <laughs> Can I borrow $400? That's a loan shark. That's not, he's not around with me. That's strong. Ah, welcome to CP Time, the only show that's for the culture. We're coming to you from Florida, but next week, Andrew Gillum could become the first black governor of the state. If he can pull it off, Andrew Gillum will join a long list of celebrated African Americans from Florida. Black people like Congresswoman Frederica Wilson, a tireless advocate who has worked to reduce dropout rates and who has been a groundbreaking pioneer in hatwear. She has hats for any occasion. The hat for when you're going to church, you then have to go to a rodeo right after. The hat for when you want to tell your enemies, oh, you think you bad? Bitch, I killed a polar bear. <laughs> and of course, the hat for when you just had to do it to him for no reason at all. Slay, Frederica, slay. But it's not just politics. Florida has been home to some of our nation's great black writers, including Zora Neale Hurston, who has written many moving, inspiring, and life-altering novels that I intended to read one day. Not the least of which is, their eyes were watching God. Which I'm told is a book about a group of people looking up at the sky. Here's a brief reenactment.
Florida is also the birthplace of black acting royalty like Sidney Poitier. While most people associate him with the Bahamas, the truth is he was actually born in Miami, two months premature. His parents were here visiting, and I guess his mother was dancing too hard, and Poitier came right on out of there. <laughs> Moving on to sports. Liberty City in Miami, Florida has always been a hotbed of NFL talent, like Chad Johnson, Antonio Brown, and my Uncle Bebo. <laughs> Uncle Bebo would have gone first in the draft in 72, but a Gator got his foot. But that's neither here nor there. We got that Gator, and he died like a bitch. <laughs> and finally, you can't talk about great black Floridians without talking about the music. First, there's the rapper literally synonymous with Florida, Flo Rida, <laughs> whose music is loved by everyone. In fact, Flo Rida is the only artist you can hear playing during a drive-by and a spin class. It's all about that crossover appeal. But long before Flo Rida adopted his confusing-ass name, Miami Rap King's two live crew made true history. Not just because of the black guy rapping with an Asian, but also in the courtroom after they were arrested on obscenity charges. But they defended the right to perform their buck nasty lyrics on songs like Me So Horny, Coochie Mama, and of course the classic Face Down, Ass Up. And they won the case. And in doing so, they ensured all of our First Amendment rights. And the right to pop that pussy. That's all the time we have for today. From Florida, I'm Roy Wood Jr. And this has been CP Time. And remember, we're for the culture. Ah, welcome to CP Time, the only show it's for the culture. In honor of this week's Veterans Day, tonight we discuss the contributions of the black soldier, the only armed black people that everybody's comfortable with. <laughs> Since America's birth, African Americans have proudly served this country, even in bondage. George Washington's personal servant during the war was a slave named William Lee. The two spent so much time together William was even able to photobomb a painting of Washington. <laughs> Lee and Washington's bond inspired many of the interracial action films we see today, such as 48 Hours, Men in Black, and Knight Rider. <laughs> you know that car was black. It had a spoiler. Many black Americans have made the ultimate sacrifice, even if by accident, as when the first shots in the Revolutionary War killed Crispus Attucks. Though not a member of any militia, Crispus is my favorite character to play in reenactment, mostly because his part is so short and I get to go home early. <laughs> Crispus, look out, huh? Oh! Lord, I done died for these white people. <laughs> Those were his actual last words. <laughs> in the Civil War, black soldiers fought for the Union in regiments like the famous 54th Massachusetts Infantry. And even the Confederacy, upon realizing they were gonna lose the war, started drafting black soldiers. The South learned the same lesson the NBA did in the 50s. If you don't have any black people, you ain't even in the game. <laughs> Moving on. In World War I, the 369th Infantry Regiment fought so fiercely that the Germans called them the Harlem Hellfighters. And when a German says you know how to whoop ass, that means something. <laughs> the Great War also provided many black fighters with their first chance to travel abroad. And once in France, our brothers in arms found something they had never seen before, respectful white people. It was so enjoyable in Europe that a lot of black soldiers didn't come back, which I understand. I went to Belgium for two days, ended up staying the whole summer with Helga. Oh, she knew how to iron that Belgian waffle. Oh, my waffles. I was there for three months. And then my wife found out. I'm sorry, baby. Please, please let me come home. Please. <laughs> World War II would be a similar undertaking for black soldiers, as the only N-word they heard overseas was Nazi. 
This war also introduced us to the Tuskegee Airmen, the first African-American military aviators. While history may tell you that there were 932 pilots, it should have been 933. My Uncle Bebo was supposed to be a Tuskegee Airman, but they ran out of planes, which is a shame, because he would have put a hurting on them Nazis, but all they gave him was a bicycle. Couldn't even ride over there, because of the ocean. And in the modern era, no discussion of black veterans is complete without Colin Powell, the first African-American general to become the Joint Chiefs Chairman and the first black Secretary of State. He helped lead America into the Iraq War, proving that a black man can ruin the Middle East just as much as a white man. <laughs> now, that's what I call true equality. <laughs> that's all the time I have for today. This has been CP Time, and I'm Roy Wood Jr. And remember, before the culture. Koga, if you're watching this program, please email me. I would like to meet our child. <laughs> Welcome to CP Time, the only show that's for the culture. Today, we discuss black people and the joyful festive holiday of Christmas. So let's start with slavery. Because remember, black people weren't celebrating Christmas before that. None of us were on the boat ride over here going fa la 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 la, deck the halls. But once they were in America, many slaves began to see Christmas for the blessing that it was. A chance to escape while their owners were away for the holidays. <laughs> the great abolitionist Harriet Tubman even used Christmas to free her three brothers. Which may sound good to you, but if I let my sister free me around Christmas, I'd never hear the end of it. <laughs> Every year, she'd be like, oh, thank you so much for the slippers. This is almost as good as the gift I got you last year. Not shackles. <laughs> and then I'd be like, shut up, Bernice. You ruined the holidays. <laughs> of course, Music is an important part of Christmas, and black people have been covering and improving the classics for years. Like Let It Snow by Boys to Men. <laughs> or Do You Hear What I Hear by Me. Here's a sample. Do you hear what I hear? Sounds like oppression. <laughs> but some holiday music is tainted with a history of racism, like the classic Jingle Bells, which at first, just seems like an innocent song about reckless driving. But back in 1857, its first public performance was part of a minstrel show sung by a bunch of white dudes in blackface. It's a terrible legacy. And that's why every time I see a one-horse open sleigh, I key that shit for justice. <laughs> but it is also important to recall the true reason we celebrate Christmas. Santa. The breakthrough for black Santas was in 1943, when one of Harlem's biggest department stores hired the country's first black Santa Claus, which surely was a distraction for customers who didn't know what was going on. I'm sure they was all like, who's that nigga in the red jacket talking to my child? <laughs> After that, black Santas took a 70-year ill until two years ago, when Larry Jefferson became the first black Santa at the white-ass Mall of America. <laughs> A victory for our people. Mostly because Larry used his employee discount to get all the black people he knew 20% off. A hero indeed. But Kris Kringle would be nothing without the gifts he brings. The toys. Without the toys, Santa's just a fat bastard that broke in your house. And for decades, manufacturers didn't even consider making toys for black children. And when they finally did, some of them would just paint white dolls black. Like this Willie Talk doll. Look at that. Looks like Willie got thrown into a bonfire. <laughs> but the great thing about kids is they'll like whatever you give them because children are not very intelligent. <laughs> like my favorite toy when I was a youngster was Mr. Chompy Chomp. <laughs> oh, I'd play with Mr. Chompy Chomp for hours. I'd make him wobble, I'd make him talk to me, and lose all his teeth. <laughs> Took me 45 years to realize this. Mr. Chompa Chomp was a staple. My good friend Cornell West told me that. That's all the time we have for today. I'm Roy Wood Jr. This has been CP Time. And remember, we're for the culture. 
Make sure you put my website up at the end so people can order my compact disc and cassettes. Thank you.